Good morning. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insegna Booksellers. And uh, uh, today is uh, the 3rd of November uh, 2022. And of course, uh, Thursday is our day when we meet here online for World History with me, with Tom Padula, live on Facebook. Now, of course, uh, this uh, actual programs, podcasts, uh, get uh, transferred across and uh, it's wonderful to be able to do this and uh, to to bring you and uh, those people who are interested in history a taste of what it was like to live in the past. Now, which is the past that we are looking at at the moment? We, we sort of finished with the Crusades and, of course, now we begin life in the Middle Ages in the towns of the Middle Ages, the, the, those uh, villages that uh, were there at the beginning of the year 1000 with very few really large cities in, in Europe, uh, things changed from then on. So what was it that caused the changes? The changes always occur when there is trade and when there is movement between people and when there is also a sense of discovery because what the Crusades uh, did to the people in Europe, it sort of opened their eyes uh, to other possibilities outside of their own areas. It's sort of, um, you know, the Vikings story, uh, in the, you know, the Vikings, the, the Turkish story, you know, the Ottoman Empire, the Seljuks, the Vikings, the French, the Spaniards, the Italians, you know, the, the Rus, the Russia. So everyone sort of comes together. Giovanni, De Lu John De Luca, welcome, welcome to the history lesson number fifty-five. It's uh, you know, it's a, it's a long way ago that I began. That was last year, and this is the second year that uh, we're tackling now the uh, the way uh, the townships developed into cities in Europe from the beginning of the year 1000 onwards because up to that time there was a lot of um, a lot of fighting in a way because uh, some of the nobles the, the nobles they had built castles to protect themselves against others and uh, then they realized that I think that it was better in a way uh, to to open up to the world, and this was caused by by a war, the war of the, the well, because the Eastern Roman Empire ha, was an, in turmoil because some of the Christians were being attacked uh, because they had been they had become pretty arrogant, really, uh, and therefore the new religion of Muslims they sort of. Islam was preaching what the Christians were preaching a thousand years before. So it says, be good, you know, do this, but you have to withstand any persecution, any maltreatment, etc., etc., etc. So if you believe in God, you'll be able to withstand all this because, you know, your body doesn't count anymore. You'll be rewarded in paradise. You're the paradise, whether it's Christian or Muslim or anywhere else, it doesn't matter. It's just that it's each religion has this sense of the eternal uh, within it. So that's the, the trade, the trade, and that crusade, the crusades began a movement in Europe, and the movement was the creation of i comuni, what the Italians called i comuni, the, the townships. And if you were close to the sea and you had to bring some soldiers to the say to Cyprus and then uh, you know the Orient where Lebanon is now or Turkey or through Greece, you you needed to use Mare Nostrum, the Mediterranean Sea. So this sort of movement was an important thing. And let's not forget that the Venice also was the queen of the sea at the time. So it's 11.29, but I'm going to just say that I will continue with Chinese history. I will go to, of course, uh, the North America, uh, we, we, you know, ancient America before, way before Christopher Columbus went there and why people were there when 
when he got there. But Christopher Columbus never really got to the mainland of America. He, he, he went to El Salvador, even though he then returned, I think, about four or five times uh, in his trips for, uh, for, the Spanish, uh, uh, for the Spanish king and queen. Very interesting times, very interesting uh, history. And there we've got Netflix, we've got all the other platforms where, uh, you know, the world history is coming to the fore. We want to know about each other a lot more. So I encourage you to go to my programs from the beginning and uh, do the journey yourself. Okay, it's 11.30 and I'm going to start. This one here, the, the first one is Trade Town Life and Travel in the Middle Ages. So uh, I'll just continue because there was more. But, but as the, this program develops, uh, we'll also go to we'll also go to the Indigenous, you know, before the invasion. We'll go to Benjamin Patterson and Henry Lawson and my trip to Darwin, etc. Okay. Okay, so let's start now with trade and town life, Marco Polo and the Mongols. That's, uh, that's the chapter that we're going to look at. And Marco Polo, by the way, Marco Polo's story on Netflix was wonderful. Uh, there were two series. Unfortunately, they cut them out because of troubles uh, by the producer with, uh, you know, his treatment of others, etc. And so the... You know, it was that that series really was a, just a, such a wonderful series one and two should have gone to series five six to the whole lot, but it didn't happen. Doesn't matter, but it was. It, if you want to watch it, it's very fantastic. Okay, let's go. So, in the Middle Ages, there were few large towns because there were very there was very little trade. In the time of William I, for instance, London was already easily the largest town in Britain. But if you could have seen it, you would have thought it only had a very large village of wooden huts with thatched roofs. So it was really like a village, really, a big one. Only parts of the Tower of London and Westminster Abbey gave promise of the great city of stone and brick that was to grow steadily during the next thousand years. So that's, uh, that's where we're at at the moment. In London, that's what happened. But the, let's not forget that in Italy, the stone uh, buildings were there in Paris. You know, you, you, you really have to look at it uh, 100 years at a time to see what development they, they really had at the time. Early medieval traders, the Vikings. Now, the Vikings, and I've watched all of the series, it's a fantastic uh, story, a fantastic story. And there was um, here locally, they've started a they've started a place called Valhalla, <laughs> where they throw the, the axes the way the Vikings did, and the name Valhalla means you know it's the place, it's the paradise of of the Vikings. Okay, during the Dark Ages, there was so little law and order that trade could not prosper. The people of each village or manor had to make for themselves, in their fields and homes, most of the necessities of life. Otherwise, they went hungry. It would be wrong, however, to think that there was no trade at all. There was always trade. It's always existed, but it was dangerous to, you know, to trade openly without the, the help of, uh, of a little army next to you. Even in the Dark Ages, the Vikings had combined trade with piracy as the Phoenicians had done before them, and there was usually a weekly market in each village at which the peasants could exchange their products. So the market, you know, the, the early part. In those villages, the market was important. Once a week, you came together and changed the goods that you needed for the things that you could provide. Merchants bring luxuries from the east. Here we go. That's after the, even before the Crusades. If we look at China, we look at the Silk Road. The Silk Road had been there thousands of years, developed slowly but surely. And that Silk Road wasn't just one road. It was many, a, a few roads that led from China into Europe. And, of course, 
uh, the Middle East and, of course, towards Russia as well, the North. So, as the years passed, many noblemen grew richer, but no matter how rich his manner, the Lord and his retainers could not eat, drink and wear more than a, a certain amount of what was produced by his serfs. So, they, you know, they didn't have the great luxuries that we now see when we watch uh, films on, in, on the Middle Ages. He, therefore, began to use his extra wealth to buy luxuries, uh, to buy luxuries like wine from France, carpets from Syria and Persia, and even spices such as pepper, which took years to come from fabulous lands like India. Far, far away, somewhere in the east. They didn't know the actual geography of it. it you know, only a few people had um, rudimentary maps. To supply and transport these luxuries, a middle or merchant class grew up in Europe, as far beneath the feudal noblemen on the one hand as they were above the serfs on the other. So these tradespeople were below the noble and above the serfs. It's the merchant class. Growth of towns and cities. And as the merchants became more influential and more numerous, the villages where they lived grew into towns and the towns into cities. They brought knowledge from outside and when you know they wanted to retire, they built the uh, they, 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 they built their, their houses in a different way from the wooden ones. Merchants' guilds buy freedom for their towns. Buy freedom, what does that mean? To protect their interests, the merchants of each town usually combined in a guild, what we now call the unions, the trade unions. These merchant guilds tried to prevent foreigners, merchants from other towns, from gaining any share in the town's business. Many merchant guilds became strong and rich enough to buy a charter from the feudal lord who owned their town or from the king or say, look, we'll pay you this much, but we, you know, after we pay, you mind your, your business, we mind ours. This charter was a legal document which granted the merchants of the town the right to govern themselves without any interference from the great folk in the castle. Many towns gained their charters at the time of the Crusades because so many noblemen wanted ready money to equip themselves and their retainers for the journey to the Holy Land. So, you know, people do things so that it suits them at the time. Craft guilds. In each town, there sprang up also craft guilds, which you should not confuse with the merchant guild. They're two separate ones, one for the merchants, one for the, the manufacturing, if you like. A craft guild was an association of all the people engaged in a certain craft or trade so that they could establish also prices for their services and goods. For example, all the shoemakers in a certain town whether they were masters, that is owners, or of a shop, workmen or apprentices would belong to the shoemakers' guild. They, that's what they did. So, and a lot of the surnames come from uh, come from these craft guilds. I can't think of a few examples right now, but they are there. The craft guilds fixed wages and prices, laid down the conditions of work for apprentices and tried, like the merchant guilds, to keep the trade within the town exclusively in their own hands. They also helped their members in times of trade, depression or sickness. Naturally, the masters usually had more power in these guilds than the workmen or apprentices had, of course. Indeed, towards the end of the Middle Ages, some craft guilds were controlled entirely by the master tradesmen. 
Welcome to Zoraida Moros, who excluded journeymen as the workers for wages were called and apprentices from membership. We should remember, however, that in most trades, each master employed, as a rule, only three or four journeymen and as many apprentices. This meant that a very high proportion of workmen could in time become masters them themselves. So th these are the merchant guilds and the, and, and, the, and the guilds that came out of the, the crafts, uh, you know, the, the various crafts available, whether you're making carpets or shoes or clothes. Those are the guilds in the Middle Ages. So we're going to stop there. And then, you know, next time we'll look at the conditions in these towns where they really beautiful places. Because uh, when we, when I visit Italy, they look absolutely splendid, those places that were uh, built during that time. But we'll, we'll, you know, we'll keep going with this. So that's, uh, that's uh, you know, that's how man makes history. Well, let me go here. Okay. The next one is, of course, you know, we're going to China now. But before that, I need a drink. Okay. So what happened in China? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, what did I say? Uh, what page? 1999. Yes, here we go. Okay, just the inventor of regular script. I'll just read this from a previous page. During the period from the end of the Han Dynasty to the beginning of the Wei Dynasty, there was a famous calligrapher named Zhong Yao who gained a full mastery of the regular script. He was the first master of regular script in Chinese history. And his calligraphy helped the transition from official script to regular script. As the ordinary written system, as the ordinary written writing system. So his method became the ordinary one. He also helped set the style of Chinese characters his representative works include statements of proclamation and statement recommending Jizi. Jizi. A portrait of Wang Zi, Wang Zi's calligraphy, part of Gu Ji pictures. I'm going to show you the pictures, okay? Let me have a look. Okay, this is the guy. Wan Zi Zi, the saint of calligraphy, and Gu Gai Zi, the matchless painter. Oh, the, the, well, the, this, uh, yeah. So this is the calligraphy here. And these are some of his writings. Okay, so that's that. Now, Wang Zi Zi, the sign of calligraphy. Wang Xi Zi, X I Z H I, the sign of calligraphy. And Gu Kai Zi, G U, uh, K I I Z H I, the matchless painter. These are two important people. And uh, let's see when Wang Zi Zi was born in 303 to 361, so in the fourth century after Christ, was born in today's Shandong, Shandong province. He was a great calligrapher of the Eastern Jin dynasty and was called by later generations the saint of calligraphy. When Zi Zi, Zi studied calligraphy under the calligraphy master Madame Wei in his youth, then he travelled widely to study tablet inscriptions executed by famous calligraphists of older generations. It is said that he used to practice calligraphy by the pond besides, beside Lan, the orchid, uh, 
pavilion in Shaoxing in today's Zhejiang province. He worked day and night until the clear pond water turned black from his dipping in his inky brush into so many times. At last he had finally formed his own unique style. Wang Zihi, unique style in both the running hand and cursive script had a great influence on later generations of calligraphers. His famous rubbing of stone inscriptions included the preface to the orchid, to orchid pavilion, preface to orchid pavilion, and the Kwai Xue Xing King rubbing. Emperor Taizong of the Tang Dynasty admired Wang Zi, Zi calligraphy and chose 1,000 characters written by Wang Zi, Zi which he included in a book titled Ancient 1000 Character Text to be used as a guide for students of calligraphy. Oh, once you get, you know, it's beautiful. That was, uh, that was Wang Zizi, the saint of calligraphy. Gu Kai Zi, 345-409. So he was born 345. Oh, you know, so he was younger, uh, sort of the next generation from Wang Zizi, he was an outstanding painter in the Eastern Jin dynasty. Later generations grouped him together with Lu Tang Wei, Zheng Shen Sheng Ya, Yao, and Wu Dao Zi, and called them the four ancestors of paintings. Wu travelled all over South China, accumulating rich materials for his paintings. Gu Kaizi was especially good at figure painting and he stressed the spirit by describing by describing and he stressed the spirit by describing. He maintained that a subject heart could be read through looking deep into his, his or her eyes. He once worked in a temple on a mural, but he did not finish the figure's eyes until visitors came. He painted the eyes and views and viewers said that the figure's face suddenly filled with energy and seemed like a real person. Gu Kaizi works have long been lost. What remains today are only facsimiles of his picture scroll of female scholars. The picture scroll of the Luo Shui River Nymph and the picture scroll of virtuous ladies. Interesting. So one left the script and the other one left the paintings. Interesting. But the paintings have been lost, except for some examples. So there you are. That's the Chinese history for the week. Interesting. Interesting. I love it. Because um, slowly it's sort of I've watched the, the you know some of the series now, so I'm familiar with Wei Tang, uh, you know the the very the Jin dynasties etc. You know you become familiar with the names, and one of the things that I must do is look at China and the the regions. Which ones are they? The main cities, the rivers, the mountains, the desert. You know a bit of geography, and also uh, the way things are now. Interesting. Okay, so that's for China. Now we go to America. For America, there's the Pacific Coastal Route. If you remember, we moved a lot of the ancient Americans, the indigenous tribes, you know, they came through the north the Beringa Bridge or whatever. So they came through the north when there was the Ice Age, the last glacial maximum, they called it, the last glacial maximum. Okay, but some people believe that uh, people arrived in, uh, in, north, in the Americas, uh, north, central and south, via the coast, Pacific Coastal Route. That's the one that's on the side, you know, where we are 
also touch on the Pacific here, on the eastern side of Australia. Okay, so it's in this big pond called the Pacific Ocean. So the Pacific Coastal Immigratory Theory proposes that people first reached the Americas via water travel, following coastlines from Northeast Asia into the Americas, originally proposed in 1979 by Newt Fledmark as an alternative to the hypothetical migration through an ice-free inland corridor. This model would help to explain the rapid spread to coastal sites extremely distant from the Bering Strait region, including sites such, such as Monte Verde in southern Chile and Taima, Taima in western Venezuela. So Monte Verde and Taima, Taima are like two little ports, you know, where people arrived from wherever they came from uh, in, the other, in the other continents. And we're talking about Asia here. The very similar marine migration hypothesis is a variant of coastal migration. Essentially, its only difference is that it postulates that boats were the principal means of travel. The proposed use of boats adds a measure of flexibility to the chronology of coastal migration because a continuous ice-free coast 16 to 15,000 calibrated years before Christ, would then not be required. Migrants in boats could have easily bypassed ice barriers and settled into in scattered coastal refugia before the deglaciation of the coastal land route was, was complete. A maritime component source population in coastal East Asia is an essential part of the marine migration hypothesis. So you can see here okay, that the migrants could come from, you know, anywhere really, uh, provided uh, there was, you know, there, uh, there was a population from which to migrate, in this case here yeah, from Asia. East Asia, they say, but we'll see. A 2007 article in the Journal of Island and Coastal Archaeology proposed a, a kelp highway hypothesis, a variant of coastal migration based on the exploitation of kelp forests along much of the Pacific Rim from Japan to Beringia. The Pacific Northwest and California and as far as the Andean coast of South America once the coastline of Alaska and British Columbia had deglaciated about 16,000 years ago, this, kept, this kelp forests, along with estuarine mangrove and coral reef habitats, would have provided an ecologically homogeneous migration corridor entirely at sea level and essentially unobstruct, unobstructed. A 2016 DNA analysis of plants and animals suggest a coastal roof was visible. So the coastal roof was, was possible, you know, feasible. Mitochondrial subaplo group D4H3A. Well, <laughs> whatever that means. A rare subclade of D4H3 occurring along the west coast of the Americas has been identified as a clade associated with coastal migration. This haplogroup was found in a skeleton referred to as Anzic-1, found in, mountain, in, in, in Montana in close association with several Clovis artifacts dated 12,500 years ago. And there's a bit more there, problems with evaluating coastal migration. We're going to do that next time. And that will be the end for, for this set of notes. So then I'll, I'll have to find other things that relate to uh, South and North America and Central America. How's that? The idea... 
that no one has discovered anything really becomes popular. Now, last week we were talking about in our Indigenous Australian history before the invasion are keeping the laws. And one of the, you know, the, the, the laws, the, mo, mo, many tribes had particular laws. So we looked at marriage and when things went wrong in a marriage, what did you do? What did they do? And stealing didn't, didn't really exist because they didn't have much, but maybe they had totems, etc. So if anyone did something wrong there, they would, you know, they, they would react. Okay, so this one here we're going to do, we're going to do uh, trial by spears. What do you mean by that here? Sorry. Here it is, trial by spears. A wronged husband and the, the person who did the, the, the wrong cannot defend himself. There, there, there is a, you know, he's defending himself, but in some other tribes they weren't allowed. They would only, you know, they would only uh, have their bodies exposed and they couldn't move from a particular area so that the wrong person could throw the spear and hurt him. Here, let's have a look. What happened here? Among the Tiwi people of Melville Island, the accused did not even have a shield. He had to stay with his feet in one place and had to bend from side to side to try and avoid the spears. Now, where did these spears come from? The idea of punishment. Here we go. Among the Tiwi of Bathurst and Melville Islands, the young man had to stand unarmed while the, the wronged husband threw spears at him. Sometimes a couple would elope if they did not like the partners that their elders had chosen for them. Okay, so, so we're talking about, you know, a couple eloping. It would be quite unusual, but it's possible. So sometimes a couple would elope if they did not like the partners that the elders had chosen for them, unless they could escape quickly enough, quickly enough, they would be chased and bitten or speared if caught by the relatives of the abandoned spouses. They might even be killed if they were in the wrong relationship to each other, as this was a serious crime against the laws of the ancestral beings. A husband who was unfaithful to his wife or neglected to give meat to her and her children might incur the wrath of her close relatives. Then her father and brothers would argue with him and even fight with him to try to make him change his behaviour. Alternatively, they would receive her back and, took her and look after her and her children if she had good cause to leave them. So, if the wife was unfaithful or neglected her duties to her husband and children, she would first be chided by her mother and father or her brothers. If she continued to misbehave, she would risk a beating from her husband, who might disown her, send her home to her parents or give her to another man. So say, you can have my wife. She's no good. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> One crime that was almost unknown in Aboriginal society was stealing or damaging property. Aborigines did not own many things that could be stolen. But if someone stole or damaged a sacred object which belonged to the whole community, then he would be punished severely. So there you are. That's... The Aborigines were pretty tough too, you know. That's uh, that's what they did. Now we have our good friends now. Here. 
Henry Lawson and Benjo Patterson. I'm going to start with um, Benjo Patterson. Henry Lawson, I'm going to go back to the short stories uh, because the, the, these short stories that came up are pretty short, but they still need a couple of two or three, uh, two or three lessons to cover them. But the, today we have one long poem by Benjamin Patterson called Father Riley's Horse. You can look it up and then you can read it you know, yourself. It's quite long. Okay, so let's go. It was the horse thief, Andy Regan, that was hunted like a dog by the troopers of the upper Murray side. They had searched in every gully. They had looked in every log, but never sight or track of him they spied. So, I suppose the Riley and the, the horse that he stole could not be found. Till the priest of Killis Crossing heard a knocking very late, Uh, as, uh, let me till the priest of Kylie Crossan heard knocking a very late and a whisper, Father Riley, come across. So his reverence in pyjamas trotted softly to the gate and admitted Andy Reagan and a horse. Now it's listen, Father Riley, to the words I've got to say, for it's close upon my death I am tonight. With the troopers hard behind me, I've been hiding all the day. In the gullies keep close and are out of sight, but they are watching all the rangers like there is no other way. Okay? So in the gullies keep them close and out of sight, but they are watching all the rangers till there is not a bird could fly. And I'm fairly worn to pieces with the strife. So I'm taking no more trouble, but I'm going home to die. This is the only way I see to save my life. Yes, I'm making home to mothers, and I'll die on Tuesday next, and be buried on, a, on the Thursday, and of course I'm prepared to meet my penance, but with one thing I'm perplexed, and it's father, it's the Jew, this jewel of a horse. He was never bought nor paid for, and there's not a man can swear to his owner or his breeder, but I know that his sire was by pedantic from the old pretender maze, and his dam was close related to the row. So these are all other horses, obviously famous and with a bit of a reputation. So this the his horse, this particular horse was. Um, you know, was a good catch, really. And there's nothing in the district that, that can raise him for a, for a step. Very good racehorse. He could canter while they're going at their top. He's the king of all the lepers. He could canter while they're going at their top. He's the king of all the lepers that was ever seen to help. And five-foot fence, he'd, he'd clear it in a hop. I don't know, five feet, pretty. So I leave him with you, Father, till the dead shall rise again. This yourself that knows a good, a good one. And of course, you can say he's got by moonlight out of Paddy Murphy's plane. Uh, if you ever ask the, the breeding of the horse. So this yourself that knows a good one, and of course you can say he's got by he's got by moonlight out of Pettis Murphy's plain, if you ever ask the breeding of the house. Well wow. I don't know whether I should go a bit longer. Yeah, I might just got to the to the end here. Or should I stop and we'll keep going next time? I'll give you a chance to read it in your you look it up, look at look it up, and it's called 
Father Riley's, Riley's horse. Here it is. Uh, you know, you can look it up even on uh, on Google. That's the story here. Father Riley's horse. And it's Banjo Patterson. Okay? So that's about it. Whoop. Now, from there, we go to here. We go to Henry Lawson. Henry Lawson. Here we go. It's quite, a, you know, quite a thing with um, the reading part, you know. Uh, <laughs> I need to keep on drinking some water to keep um, things moving. Okay. Now, Henry Lawson, there he is. In a dry season, in a dry season, and uh, it's got, um, this story's got two, three pages. So we'll do one page at a time. Okay. Draw a wire fence and a few ragged gums and add some scattered sheep running away from the train. Then you'll have the bush all along the New South Wales western line from Bathurst on. The railway town consists of a public house and a general store with a square tank and a schoolhouse on piles in the nearer distance. The tank stands at the end of the school and is not many times smaller than the building itself. It is safe to call the pub the railway hotel and the store the railway stores with an S. A couple of patient ungroomed hacks are probably standing outside the pub while their masters are inside having a drink, several drinks. Also, it's safe to draw a sundowner sitting listlessly on a bench on the veranda reading the bulletin. The bulletin was the famous uh, magazine from the 1880s very important in Australian history. The railway stores seem to exist only in the shadow of the pub and it is impossible to conceive either as being independent of the other. There is something a small oblong weatherboard building, unpainted and generally leaning in one of the, uh, in one of the eight possible directions and perhaps with a twist in another, which from its half-obliterated sign seems to have started as a rival to the railway stores, but the shutters are up and the place empty. The only town I the only town I saw that differed much from the above consisted of a box bark humpy with a clay chimney and a woman standing at the door throwing out the wash up water. By way of variety, the artist might make a watercolour sketch of a fatless tent on the line with a billy hanging over the fire in front and three fetters standing round filling their pipes. That's it. So we we'll stop at, uh, you know, at uh, the, the fetless standing round filling their pipes. We'll stop there for in a dry season because today what I want to do today I want to cover quite a lot of um, of the, the north my trip to Darwin because um, that's you know we're going to be doing Lake Argyle so this is north part of Australia interesting We'll start with a picture of me and my sister. There you are. Okay, and we'll go to it. That's, that's it there. Okay, now from here, we'll, let, let, let's see what I say. Angela was 
We're starting today at 6.30. And uh, you said, let's go for a walk outside. And we are here. Enjoying Kanamara. Kananara. Kananara. Kanamara. Kunumura in Italian. Kununura. Kananara. That's it. Okay. Done. She's already walked up. <laughs> Okay, well, this is part of it. You can see we're interested in the trees. And this is Kananara, Shade Loop Foot Path, Foreshaw, Lakeside, Nerma National Park. I'm always intrigued by, uh, uh, you know, by the signs. Catherine to Darwin, Wyndham, Portland, Lord Ar Lake Argyle, Ord Dam, Dam, Diversion Dam. Okay, so that's we. Where are we now? Here, and this beautiful area, plain. There we are, kind of narrow. Little bird went for a walk. Of course, that's the local. Had to picture that one, and we met this lady here with the dog. Going for a walk as well, a bit of a chat, and Kananara in early morning. There we are. More of the locals having breakfast. And the sunshine in my eyes. And this, one of those trees, you know, the boabs. Grows pretty, pretty big. And what what's this? Oh, this I was intrigued by this. And this a uh, tree with I couldn't understand what that was. Ah, oh, the birds, of course. I was looking for the birds. The Cambridge Cananara. That's it. Nice and easy. The blue there, look at that. Unbelievable. <laughs> a good spelling. That's a beautiful, beautiful English. Restaurant. Restaurant. They've probably done it on purpose. And the pool, which we couldn't use because... They had to bring somebody in to clear it or whatever. And that was breakfast. There we are. And now we're on our way. This is part of the trip. Now, instead of taking lots of footage, I decided to take pictures. You can see you know, the terrain better like this. There you are. Quite a lot. You know, the see, uh, what you prefer better, the footage or, or this? Probably a bit of both. Wouldn't go astray, but I did a lot of um, clicking here. Look at that. Look at that. Beautiful. This, this a rock. Rocky. Now that's see that would be a beautiful picture on a wall. A, a painter's paradise. This one here. The painters would capture these. Look at that. Amazing. Look at this one here, the rock formation.
they're just from the rock then to the plane and it's but look at this one here beautiful absolutely gorgeous change in color no it's a bit blurry Can you imagine a fire there will just catch so quickly and this this water look at it yes this is lake argyle area lake argyle australia's north northwest look at that beautiful Now, what are we doing in Lake Argyle? You tell me. And where is the lake? That's on the way there. On the way to Lake Argyle. And there we are. We're almost there now. One below. <laughs> I was intrigued by the by the rocks, the formation. Now they look so old. And it's of course our bus. Here we are. Yeah. Vistas formation, different type of gum tree there. And it's one of the stations they've built just very near Lake Argyle. And here we are, Angelus there, Maria. You get the idea of the, you know, of the place through these pictures. That's the lake in the distance. We're getting there slowly but surely. There. You are. Beautiful place. There we are, coming out of the boat that we're going to go into the boat. A couple of boats, this young lady here was part of the cruise and explaining what we're going to do. Oh, let's have a look. Sorry. There we go. Yes, here. Safety measures. First of all, I need to know about it straight away. There are some life rings just on top of the toilet cubicle there. We'll just throw it in their general direction, doesn't have to last over. And I will. Yes. Uh, that was a quick one. <laughs> so then we, we went off and.
and then we started our cruise. So that you know, it's very hard to capture the um, uh, the actual meaning of what she said, but I hope you got a little bit of it. A description of how the lake came about, what's the use for it. Very windy and a bit cold, but uh, it was just wonderful too. But the, the weather was magnificent. You know, the boat went reasonably fast in places, but not all the time. As I, I took a, a pick there, it's good. I thought because it's the same, you know, the, the, when it comes to water, it's the same thing, but still it gives you an idea. So you've got to be there to really enjoy it, but at least you see it. And these are the rocks that we saw before. Same. 
then this little animal there. Ah, uh, where is it? Everyone gets excited about seeing an animal. <laughs> I can't remember what, what it was. It's true. Trying to catch it. There it is. There. No soup, you'll see. Oop. it again yes yeah. <laughs> trying to follow it I tell you there it is again two of them there they are Still on those. Took a while, but we took a few good pictures. There you are, big one. Wow. Really There's another one there. Whoa! A colony. Okay. Oh, good place to be. <laughs> I got it with the picture in the background. Good. So there's life even in those rocks. Huh? Life. Well, I'm going to see how we're going for time. If I, I'd like to finish with Lake Argyle, but I think it's quite a lot here. We'll have to continue next week.
Well, I might have to leave it there uh, for today. And uh, as uh, the young lady there is explaining everything about Lake Argyle. Uh, okay. Let's have a look. Where were we? Lake Argyle. Well, that was quite uh, an experience, really. And she was about five. Well, there's quite a, quite a lot. There's a lot more to, to do here. There's a lot more. And uh, we'll continue next week. I think that's how it is. So we saw the little marsupials there. That's good. Look, it's, you know, I'm trying to sort of combine a lot of elements here. Uh, the international, the local you know, the environmental, the environment really, the Australian environment, it changes. There's so many, it's such a rich country in terms of, uh, in terms of its, uh, you know, of, of the different types of environments that are created along the way. It's a big country after all. Lake Argyle was quite, uh, quite an experience. I enjoyed it very much. And, um, that's it for today. Thank you very much for being on. I remind you that, uh, you know, please share my work. It's, uh, there's quite a bit there, but it's with the encouragement to move about and discover the world and even from home in terms of studying history. Okay, on that note, thank you very much for being with me. Uh, today, I'll see you next time. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insegna Booksellers. And now, ciao.